This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Mirrorless cameras were always intended to be more portable than traditional DSLR cameras. But over the past nine years, they have gotten significantly larger. Now just take a look at the original A7R compared to the A7R5. This is why I believe that the Sony A7C line of cameras exist and why they are so popular. This isn't going to be a long video because the Sony A7C2 and the A7CR, they're essentially a compact version of the A7IV and A7R5. Now you're getting the same sensors, image quality, video frame rates, and so much more. There's just no point in repeating those specs and doing those comparisons that I would normally do because they're about 95% the same. Instead, I'm gonna be focusing on what's different, what's improved, and what are some of the drawbacks that come with these smaller cameras? The A7C2 is the more interesting camera out of the two because it's better in ways that it shouldn't be better. You know, when compared to the A7 IV, despite being much smaller and about 22% lighter. Now, one of my biggest issues with the a7 IV has always been the overheating in video when recording for long periods of time it's always been inconsistent now the a7c2 is surely going to be worse right well according to my thermal camera in every test that i did the a7c2 ran visibly hotter than the a7 IV and even to the touch for the entire duration of recording but it was able to somehow outlast the a7 IV in both 4K 60 and 4K 30 recording. It's always tricky doing these tests because there's so many factors that can change the outcome. Just like simply flipping out the screen allows the heat to dissipate much better. The a7 IV can sometimes give me more than an hour of recording at 4K 30 with the screen out, but then some other time in similar conditions, it will overheat in 30, 40 minutes. Regardless, I'm impressed with the A7C2 and how it can record 4K 60 and 4K 30 pretty much until the battery dies every single time, whether the screen is open or closed. The A7C2 inherits the same AI processing unit that has been seen in cameras like the Sony A7R5, but it's not the same autofocus system. Now the A7C2 still retains the 759 point phase detection autofocus from the a7 IV compared to the 693 point that's on the a7R5. Now with this AI processing unit, you now get access to much better subject detection and a wider range of subjects to choose from. In my honest opinion, the autofocus was already great on the a7 IV, super reliable and accurate. And where I've really seen the new AI autofocus shine for me, is when subjects are not facing the camera, when I'm shooting in low light situations, and also when shooting animals. One thing that I have not seen an improvement on is the stickiness of touch tracking. Now I use that a lot for my product B-roll, like for this video, and it still struggles in the same ways. Nonetheless, this is a huge AF improvement over the previous version. You also get an improved IBIS mechanism that now gives you seven steps versus the old five step in the A7 IV. Sony says that this is an all new mechanism. I really didn't get a chance to test it, but judging from what I get on the A7R5 and its eight step IBIS, it definitely helps with micro jitters that come from handheld footage when stationary and also for handheld side to side B-roll shots. Now, just like the Sony FX3, FX30, A6700, and the ZV-E1, you can now import your own custom LUTs, allowing you to preview the final result on the rear screen. I shoot everything in S-Log3, and for my personal use, 
This really helps me when I'm dialing in my settings and my white balance for a specific shot, like, like the one I'm doing here. Now the rear screen is technically the same size in resolution at 1.04 million dots, but now you get the newer menu structure of the Sony ZV-E1. Now because the A7C2 has the AI unit, you now get access to auto framing, which if you've never heard about this, th you know, this is an amazing feature for solo creators like myself that doesn't always have someone filming them. Now with this feature, the camera will continuously adjust framing as if someone was there filming you. Now, once the camera recognizes a subject enter the frame, it will zoom in and a white box will appear on the rear screen around the subject and it will follow them as they move. It can get a bit tricky when using this with multiple people in the frame as it might bounce around person to person depending on their movements. But if someone is behind the camera, they could just tap on the person that they want to focus on and the auto framing will just focus on them. I am really having a lot of fun with this feature and I plan on using it more on my Sony ZV-E1, which is my primary video camera right now. What do you lose with the Sony A7C2? You lose the two card slots. You lose out on the much better ergonomics and custom buttons. You lose out on the larger electronic viewfinder, which isn't the most impressive on the A7 IV anyways. Now, credit to Sony, the original A7C's EVF is 0.59x magnification. This thing is unusable for me, to be honest. But they did improve it, increasing the A7C2 to 0.7 magnification and also making it brighter. According to Sony, it's almost as bright as the one in the A7R5. When putting them both to my eye, the difference is very noticeable. And I would say it's much more usable, even on location and in the studio. Still not my favorite. With the Sony A7CR, it's kind of the same thing. Look at the Sony A7R5 spec sheet and they're like 95% the same camera. The added features to the A7CR include the ability to import LUTs like the A7C2 and auto framing. Now these features are not in the A7R5. Now a couple things that you lose with the A7CR is the eight step IBIS that they muted on the A7R5. It has the seven step IBIS that is in the A7C2. You can get up to eight frames per second in continuous shooting with the A7CR compared to the 10 frames per second on the A7R5. You also cannot shoot 8K video and you lose out on those dual card slots. The most disappointing thing for me is that you don't get that four-way flip screen, which is my favorite of all time on any camera. Ergonomically, both the A7C2 and the A7CR look almost identical to the original A7C and the improvements that they made to this camera, this much smaller camera, it feels like you're using one of its bigger brothers. Now you get this new mode dial switch up top. You get a new dial on the front by the grip, which was much needed. Adjusting the shutter speed on the A7C using the spinning wheel, that's, that's not the answer. You now get a custom button up top next to the menu, a digital interface hot shoe that allows for those amazing wireless mics, and even the K3M XLR adapter. You also get the anti-dust function, which really helps you keep your center free of dust. The A7, original A7C does not have that. The startup time is so much faster than the OG A7C. It's got the same ports and shutter sound of the A7C. The grip is larger and it feels better in the hand, but I do wish that they included the same grip that's on the A6700, which is more like a soft rubber. It's easily one of my favorite grips that Sony has ever put on a camera. Wrapping up my thoughts, I kind of have mixed feelings about these cameras. It has less to do with the cameras themselves, but more like I'm tired of seeing cheaper cameras get new features that my more expensive and relatively new cameras don't have, or it, it seems like 
they'll never have it because the lack of firmware updates. I understand that the A7C2 and the A7CR, they're not meant to replace the A7 IV and the A7R5. These are clearly meant for people who prioritize portability. Now I understand that the A7 IV doesn't have an AI chip, so upgrading something like the autofocus wouldn't be possible or anything involving those features. But how is it that the smaller, lighter, cheaper A7C2 with the same internals perform better with overheating when clearly it gets hotter and it stays hotter for the duration of the recording? That just leaves me scratching my head. Now the A7R5 does have an AI chip and I would love for this camera to get a feature like auto framing in it so that I can occasionally use it as a B cam when I'm testing out other products. This is a $4,000 camera after all, but let's be real. It's probably not gonna happen, but I digress. The A7C2 is going to be priced between $2,100, $2,300. I haven't been given the official price yet, but no matter what it is, it's still cheaper than the A7 IV, you know, after, two years it's still one of the best hybrid cameras on the market and to think that you get nearly everything that camera has to offer actually you get much more with some of the features like the new autofocus the ai features the better overheating performance you still get that super crispy oversampled 4k footage you get that 32 megapixel photography sweet spot with insane low light performance in a small lightweight rangefinder style body. Not to mention how you can use this camera as an APS-C camera. You could throw an APS-C lens and make it super, super portable. Now this makes it one hell of a hybrid camera for the money. The A7CR is going to be priced between 2,900 and 3,200. Let's say it's going to be 3,100. That's $700 cheaper. That's a decent amount of savings on a relatively new camera and that's probably why they stripped it of some capabilities instead of just adding some like they did with the a7c2 now to be fair not having the ak video the eight step ibis and losing two frames per second in continuous shooting it's it isn't really that big a deal for me i i see someone buying a camera like the a7r5 because they care about photography first and not having that really nice big and bright evf is something that's something that's really important for this kind of user, not to mention this four-way flip screen. Now, by adding video first features like the ability to import custom LUTs and auto framing, I think this camera is for, it might seem obvious, but the photographer that wants the best, the absolute best image quality photos in a small travel size camera or for that like 60-40 hybrid content creator who wants the best of both worlds and wants to stay lightweight. The only thing that I'm 100% sure about is that regardless of what camera you have, you're gonna need a website. So you need to go ahead and check out Squarespace. If you have been looking to start a website, blog, or an online store, you need to check them out ASAP. Every entrepreneur needs a website, and with Squarespace, you don't need to have any kind of graphic design skills to start. It's so easy to use. You have 24-7 customer support. If you ever get bored of the look, you can choose from a bunch of pre-made templates and switch everything up at a click of a button. You can also start your own online store like I did where I sell my Lightroom presets and my retouching tutorial to make some passive income. If you want to check them out for yourself, use the coupon code Manny and you'll get 10% off your first purchase.